I was one of the thousand so-called prominent citizens trained by Al Gore's climate project more than 10 years ago uh, to go around and flash really amazing slides that took a long time to load. And I, I found that the, um, the complexity of the sort of pushback from eccentric people in the audience was proportional to the complexity of the slides. And so I've decided to keep it kind of simpler. But my goal, I think what I understand that I'm here to do is, is really twofold. One is to just summarize the reality of the situation in a way that will hopefully help you all to walk out of here saying there is not any time not to act, but I don't have to crawl under the bed. Um, we have a path forward. And second, I want to talk a little bit about communication strategy as well as organizing because it is not all that easy. Um, as a species, I'm convinced we are not really whiz-bang at pattern recognition. You know, it's like you can see something right in front of you, but like, oh no, that's not happening. And so we have to help each other see the pattern without getting punched. Um, so I'm going to start doing something that um, all the experts say not to do. And that is I'm going to just roll out some facts and get them, get them on the table. All right. Um, and actually, I'm going to do it in the context of a story. So once upon a time, um, there was a country, there was a pioneering country that liked to think of itself as the greatest, the most special place. It was a country that really liked to push the frontier and, you know, take what it needed to get done what it wanted. And, uh, you know, that country gave us the railroads and the, you know, highways and airplanes and power plants and the internet and selfies and I don't know if we invented ice cream, but, you know, we've been the source of an awful lot of good. And at the same time, we've been a source of um, kind of innovation that feeds innovation. And we get on the train and we don't know always how to get off the train. Um, at the time that the Industrial Revolution started, we did not know uh, most of the elements in the periodic table. We did not know about parts per million or billion or trillion of anything. We did not have analytical chemistry. We did not know how to model trends. Um, we were innocent and honest about creating the fossil fuel economy and the industrial revolution. And it made an awful lot of things better for an awful lot of people. And I share that perspective to start because I think it allows us to have a no blame conversation. We all know how to have a blame conversation, right? <laughs> okay? Uh, but that tends to backfire. Blame feeds blame. So in case we ever want to have a no blame conversation, I think there's a way to be there, to stand there. Um, so we now know that the concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are incredibly precisely correlated with increases in global average surface temperature and that our planet has warmed more than a degree centigrade and that there's a threshold around 350 parts per million of those gases that we have exceeded, and that our, um, the impacts of climate change are visible, okay? 
We know that the average surface temperature is up two degrees Fahrenheit since 19th century. I'm going to read this. Um, most of it is in the last 35 years. 16 of the um, 17 hottest days have been in the last, uh, since 2001. Um, ocean surface increase, sea level rise was eight inches all of last century. It's been 16 inches already this century. Um, and Antarctic and Arctic ice sheet mass reduction and record high and low temps and extreme rainfall. <sighs> okay. So this is real. And, and you know, think in your experience of what makes it real to you. I mean, maybe it's I walk into a cafe that I've been going for years, and there's a sign on the door that says, use this door, not that one because of, this door is locked because of high wind. Um, I have a photo that a colleague sent me of a daffodil, a patch of daffodils that he took in Brooklyn in February a few years ago. So, you know, whatever it is, it's the facts and then it's the image and the experience and it's what it's doing to the, you know, the synchrony of nature and the migration of our critters and you know, whether we will have maple syrup in 50 years. So it's all of that. Um, the scientific consensus is really robust. Um, I was looking with uh, real relief today at NASA's website, which still has all the stuff on it. Um, climate science, frequently asked questions, wonderful links. Um, and a 2009 statement by 18 major scientific societies, including American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the umbrella association. Observations throughout the world make it clear that climate change is occurring. Rigorous scientific research demonstrates that the greenhouse gases emitted by human activities are the primary driver. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, there's one thing about hearing somebody else say it, there's another thing about finding the words that I can say. And I'm sharing some of this because I think, and really NASA's website uh, made me so happy because it's got lots of things that we can take and make our own and incorporate with our own stories. Um, but as this country that likes to think of itself as doing the right thing all the time, uh, started to come to terms with climate change, of course it was complex, and of course we danced with reality, and of course through the, you know, 2000s, 2010s, um, we got it and then we backed away, because it's very disturbing. Um, you know, Bill McKibben published The End of Nature and everybody was reading it, and then we weren't. Um, and as that conversation moved along, those of us who have been concerned have said, well, how do we even describe this? Thank you. Um, you know, it's not only warming, there's weird winter episodes. Um, you know, is it warming? Is it destabilization? Or maybe do we prefer global weirding? Um, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and as we all work that through, there came into prominence a minority of folks with a really different story. And that different story was about how there really is not a scientific consensus. And we are all sheep. And we are all putting this idea about climate change forward to advance our own political agenda. And there are a lot of those folks. Um, and you know, you hear the story that scientists are just doing what they do uh, for the grants. Anybody ever live on grants? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like how much or not, yeah. Um, and I find that especially interesting because not only do scientists, you know, that would have to be massive collusion across thousands of agencies and 190 countries, but it also would have to be collusion among people who compete with each other for funding. Uh, so I find that kind of unlikely. Um, there is research, though, about the dividedness of the country, and I want to share that a bit because it, it impacts how we have the conversation. 
Um, and Yale University is actually a great hub of research on the psychology of climate change. Uh, Dr. Tony Lazarowitz and his group have a project called the Six Americas, and they do these segments of the population. It, it, it changes from year to year, but we basically fall into six groups, and he calls them the alarmed, uh, concerned, and then uh, there's two levels of uncertain, and then there's skeptical and completely denying. Um, and they vary not only at not only in what they think of climate change, but also in how they trust authority and institutions. And, you know, there has been, for this pretty much whole duration, there's been, you know, 11 to 18 percent, someplace in there, of people in the country who are alarmed about climate change. You know, that's more people than it took to make hush puppies a consumer trend. That is enough people if that group of people act strategically to move things. There's also been about the same number of people who are denying and pushing back. But the largest segment of the population by far is in the middle, confused about climate change, confused about the science, and confused about who to trust. And what that says to me is you know, we have to not just do what I did. We have to be comfortable with the data. We have to be confident in saying this is a really clear story, and this has been a really uh, unbelievably methodical process within the scientific community to get the story. But we also have to build trust and personal credibility with the people that we are trying to have the conversation with. Um, so we've, since, you know, 2007 is when I did the Al Gore training, the Inconvenient Truth came out, uh, there was already a kind of a pushback movement happening. Um, in that period, there, we sort of shifted between 2007 and 2011, um, from a situation where we were debating and the, and the scientific community was just saying, kind of finalizing the consensus and saying, are we really sure? And, you know, looking critically. Uh, in 2011, there was uh, what I really admire a project, a Berkeley Earth um, project, which was funded in part by the Koch family. And they intentionally reached across the political divide for funding and um, kind of looked at how to, you know, looked at all the doubts and, and kind of put them away and, you know, confirmed the reality, you know, that, that human-caused climate change is just, there is no real counter evidence and all the evidence points to it. Um, at that point, everybody started saying, what does this mean? In the, in the scientific community and in, you know, among citizens and advocates. And the idea of how far are we going, how fast are we going, uh, the notion of a carbon budget came into being, 350.org came fully into life saying we have to keep uh, greenhouse gases below 350 parts per million and they're now over 400. Um, and interestingly, Bill McKibben, who I adore, uh, came up with the idea that to do that, we have to really create a separation in, in the culture. We have to say, and, and this is a strategic idea that I want you to think about with me because it's had real implications in how we engage with the issue. Um, it, a few years ago, McKibben basically came to the conclusion that we have to make the fossil fuel industry rogue. We have to say they are no longer mainstream the fossil fuel based economy is no longer mainstream. We, you know, we're, we're grabbing the arc of history and we're running with it. Um, you remember his Do the Math tour a few years ago was really about looking at the numbers of, con you know, the concentration of carbon pollutants in the atmosphere and how it cannot get higher. Um, that has created a push uh, that I think helped to get us to Paris before we left Paris. Um, but it also created consequences. And I want to share that ever since the election, 
I've been having regular social media conversations with groups of folks who voted for Donald Trump and who think that we are all basically ideological sheep and feel sorry for us. And I live in the town of Enfield, and we are a Republican majority town. I, um, <laughs> I'm proud that I got an energy-saving referendum passed, and I got my yard signs from the Republican Party chairperson, and she was very nice to me. Um, but I've got a sense of how those of us who have this concern are perceived by those of us who are honest, decent people across the spectrum. And they look at this idea that the fossil fuel industry, which pumps, you know, puts gas in our cars and keeps our industry going, that, it, that that's rogue, who are you? You're the people who were inciting violence in Berkeley a month or so ago. You're the people who condone that artist with the violent Trump image. They see it as all one thing. And I think we have to be very careful that yes, we need to grab the arc of history and move it away from fossil fuels, but we don't necessarily need to vilify the industry. We don't necessarily need to vilify anybody. I'm an oceanographer by training, but I'm also an evolutionary biologist at heart. Uh, as a scientist, I live my life and I die through data. So my talk's a bit more sciencey, but don't worry, I'm going to walk you through all the figures and all the slides that I'm going to show. I have some really nice figures for follow-up questions where I'm going to show you the cyclical nature about climate change, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what could this happen in our food web and how it's going to affect our trophy system. Um, as an educator, you know, at UConn, I really like audience participation, so don't feel the need to wait until the end to ask me questions. If you have anything, while the pressure your head, just raise your hand. We'll have a brief discussion about that. All right? Especially if you're having an issue with any of the slides that I show. In retrospect, I didn't realize the screen would be so far, so some of them can be hard to see, but I'm going to do my best to really help everybody, everybody understand. All right, so, all right, so here are our ecological systems, our different levels that, uh, as ecologists, we study, right? Essentially, right, we go down from the individual up to the biosphere. Now, when we're changing an environment, it affects all these levels. And the issue is once we change some of those early levels, such as the individual level, which is what a lot of my research looks at, it has these compounding effects of this level of organization in the uh, ecological system. So I'm going to highlight a couple of theories and a couple of hypotheses that state how it can change these and kind of discuss with you how it has these large scale of these bigger picture issues. So, here we have all, as what the previous speaker talked about, these anthropogenic influences, or human-induced influences. Um, it's not just how we're changing the climate, per se, but we have a lot of also effects on pollution, on runoff, on habitat destruction, right? Habitat destruction is one of the largest reasons why we're seeing disappearances of different species and collapses of ecosystems. What I'm going to focus on today really is what we see in this upper right-hand corner, the, the aspect of climate change. So, pretty far, the main purpose of this is, yes, the carbon cycle, which dictates a lot of, the, a lot of these climate change aspects, is very complex. This is one of the real big stumbling blocks. There's no easy answer, right? I've had conversations with numerous people with the lay public, my family members who are saying, well, you know what, yeah, climate change happened, we're not the biggest contributor to volcanoes, right? And we can see in this picture, it's the same exact one, but now putting numbers on it. So we can actually have data to really show and talk about people. And that in yeah, this complex situation, which is very different than a complicated one, right? A complicated one means that there's many needless and obtuse steps. Complex simply means there's lots of steps, but each one is straightforward and they interact with each other in a very um, myriad of you know, different ways. So I should have, right, up here, for example, volcanoes. Yeah, we produce a ton of CO2 in the air, and that does contribute significantly to the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. However, the, right, the box right next to it, which is combustion, that's us, volcanoes. 
right? And if you look right next to that, we have respiration. That's us breathing right now. We're emitting CO2 as we breathe. This is a metabolic byproduct. It's somewhat balanced by photosynthesis, right? When this, the, how plants actually are making um, tissue, right? By incorporating CO2 from the atmosphere. So as we can see, it is very complex, but there's demonstrable evidence of showing that we are changing it, right? So up here, these are the greenhouse gases. All right, I'm just going to briefly look through it. If we take in a breath of air right now, the majority of it is nitrogen, right? The vast majority, we can see 78%, almost 80%. Only 21% of the air is actually oxygen. That's why if you're in the hospital and you have a respiratory illness, they'll give you an oxygen mask, which inflates the concentration of oxygen that you're giving into your lungs, which makes it easier for your body to get O2. Only a very, 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 very tiny portion of the air that we see actually contributes to what I want to talk about, this greenhouse effect or the warming effect on this earth. And that poses another additional constraint, right? It's how can something that takes up such little percentage of our atmosphere have such a huge effect, right? People say carbon dioxide is only 0.03%, right? If we're increasing it by 10%, it's still 0.0003% increase, right? And the key is it goes back to that complexity, right? It's not proportional to how much it is, it's proportional to how it behaves in the atmosphere. So that greenhouse effect that I was just talking about, right? The reason why pumping CO2 in the atmosphere causes this increase in temperatures, right? Is it's based on the everyday greenhouse. We have solar radiation coming from the sun. It passes through those glass panes, right? The plants inside of it absorb it, and then they re-emit it as a different type of energy, infrared energy, right? And that infrared energy can't pass back through those glass panes and instead gets trapped inside the greenhouse. And that's why we get the elevated temperatures in the greenhouse relative to outside. Now the Earth's atmosphere does the same exact thing, right? We're getting all of our energy at the very basic. All of the energy that comes from the Earth is due to the sun, right? That energy is coming in a solar radiation, about a third of it is being bounced off by the upper atmosphere. What comes back in, a portion of it is going to be reflected off of the surface of the Earth. And there's a great demonstration, right, about the albedo of the Earth, depending on the color, depends on how much is going to be reflected back, right? And then when it hits that atmosphere again, it's going to act just like the panes of that greenhouse. Some of it may pass through. But the more, the thicker that pain is, the more greenhouse gas we have, the more that gets reflected back towards the Earth, right? So the more CO2, the more greenhouse gases that we put into it, the greater the greenhouse effect, is what we say, right? The more heat that's trapped inside the Earth, and that's what causes temperatures to rise in certain places, all right? So, if we, we're just kind of, kind of, that's the last part that we should focus on. So now we, we had a really great question about, all right, CO2 is cyclical. I want to kind of show you that it all depends on scale. And that a lot of the times when people argue that there's these different scales, these different cyclics, uh, cyclical patterns, you have to really be careful and skeptical. I want to go through different levels. So right now, I got this this morning from the Mono Loa uh, observatory in Hawaii, right? This is like the gold standard for CO2 concentrations. It's one of the highest uh, places on, on Earth that has an observatory, and it's considered to be pristine air, right? We're pretty high. We're already over 400 ppm, right? Oh, so we can say we have a ton of CO2. This is really bad. But if we were just to go back, right, now just a couple years, we can say, well, it's only 400 for certain times of the year. Now we're starting to see these seasonal cycles, which is the red lines, the squiggly lines that I'm showing you. That black line is the average overlaid onto it. So now depending on what time frame we're looking at, depends on the effect that we, were to, that we can see. Now if we go back even further, we have a video. If 
If we go back in further, we can see this variation occur. And I think this is really important because again, when people, when deniers want to cite that it's cyclical, that it's not as high, that a couple of years ago it was lower, all those by themselves may be an accurate statement, but it's a misrepresentation of the trend that we're really looking at. And I think that's really the key. Right? We can see just how this line bobs up and down. It is that, you know, we have four seasons in most portions of the earth. That's going to affect productivity from plants. Plants aren't sucking up any CO2 in the middle of winter in the northeast. Right? They're not photosynthesizing. However, animals are still breathing, so we're still producing CO2 from respiration. Right? So we have to really look at these long-term trends. So if we go back to the 1960s, now we're moving out even further. We can see clearly that even if we take into account those seasonal trends within each year, which takes into account the daily trends, right, that we're seeing, we notice with the water layer observations, we're still sitting high. Now, if we zoom out even further to address the question that we had just before, right, this is going back 400,000 years. Yeah, right? These, these types of cycles definitely have um, been observed, right? We can tell those looking at historical data through uh, isotope analyses of different rock beds, right, of the different permafrost. But herein lies one of the really key points that I want to highlight. Yes, this has occurred, but never at this rate, right? And anytime someone tells you climate change is cyclical, you can without a doubt tell them it's never occurred this fast, right? And as an ecologist, that's what really concerns me and interests me, is that, yeah, evolution occur really quickly for some organisms, right? So we're changing the environment faster than these species may have genetic capacities to keep up with. And that's why we're seeing all these negative repercussions that are going on right now. So if we kind of now look at this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right, which is that gold standard across the globe, which includes all leading scientists from all the different leading research institutes. Here, we're having a bunch of different scenarios. The, um, the, if you see the, the black line in the bottom, I'm trying to do this without looking at the screen, I apologize, right? The black line at the bottom of that screen is actually observations, the data I just showed you from before, right? On the top are different projections, meaning best case scenario, we don't move past 2,000 level, right? That's never gonna happen, it's already impossible, right? Versus worst case scenario is that kind of magenta line on top, those are the corresponding. Now, with that corresponding amount of combustion, let's look at the corresponding amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? So this is pretty big. So, sure, if we were trying to stabilize it, it might only increase slightly, but more than likely, we're still gonna see huge increases in CO2, right? So now, let's go back, move back to what we talked about with the greenhouse gas effect. We have lots of CO2, how is that gonna affect our temperature, right? So here, the yellow line represents, if we were to maintain the CO2 output, right, prediction from the year 2000, the temperature would only increase slightly. Whereas more realistically, we're seeing these large increases, right? And when I say large, I'm gonna talk about one to three degrees Celsius. Most people don't consider that large. But as I'll demonstrate today, it's actually a pretty, pretty big deal to organisms living in the environment. Right? And so those increases kind of brings up to the basic question that I want to talk about here is why is temperature so important to organisms? Right? So I want to bring up a little figure real fast. Right? The whole basis is this is a nutshell of how populations deal with temperature. There's two main takeaways. There's one temperature we do best at. Outside of that temperature, we do pretty crap. Right? The second takeaway is this figure is not symmetrical. Right? Notice on the right hand side, it drops off really quickly. Why is that? Well, as we increase the temperature, right, metabolism starts to rev up, we go a little faster, things get better, we hit that sweet spot where 
to see the perfect place where enzymes are working as efficiently as possible, our metabolism can't be any more fine-tuned. That's the temperature of peak performance, or maximum performance. But now, anybody who makes breakfast in the morning, when you crack an egg, right, and you cook it, what happens to those whites? They go from that clear, transparent, to white. That's what they call them, egg whites. Is there any way to go from egg whites back to the transparent? No. Why? Because we've increased the temperature and we've broken the proteins, right? And we can't put those proteins back together. The enzyme in our bodies are proteins. So once we get to that temperature where we're denaturing or breaking those enzymes, it's game over. So the slight increase past our peak performance can have huge effects. Right? Because if we're frying that in, right? We can't put them back together. And that's the issue. This is really what I want to... I just had a conversation with a student about this before the semester. Um, they said, you know, what's one degree Celsius? It gets to be 60 degrees differences in New England. And these are really valid concerns. But from a mean average and from a population average, one to two degrees is a huge deal. Right? It can put you over the edge. Right? If you're already living where you're at your peak performance, even past it, where it's a little bit too hot for you, and then it goes one degree warmer, it's no, there's no point of living there anymore because you can't make a living. Right? It's a bad deal because if you look at the, the commitments under Paris, China gets to emit a lot more than the United States, even though it's the biggest emitter. So clearly, this is a bad deal if these are the only two graphs you ever look at. All right? But that's not how it looks to the Chinese or most other people in the world. Let's look at historical responsibility. Greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for 100, 150 years. Methane is not as long-lived, but is, if I, if I get any science wrong, call me that. Uh, methane is not as long-lived, but, but is more potent. Um, so if we just look at 1990 to 2011, which is just the, the this is a particular graphic that I, that I thought was nice. Um, the, the United States, over that period, emitted a little bit more than China. Okay, and here's the European Union. So you can see that the three are roughly equal over that period. So what's happened over that period is that U.S. emissions have gone down relative to China. Okay, they haven't gone down uh, necessarily in absolute terms. This is a, a distribution. Now that's just 1990. Okay, but remember, greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere for a lot longer than a couple of decades. So if we go back to 1850, okay, this is the United States, 27%. This is the countries that are today in the European Union, a roughly equal amount. And this is a little bit here is China. Okay, so from the Chinese perspective, they're being penalized because they didn't start polluting early enough. Okay? I mean, that, that's how it looks, all right, from the Chinese perspective. Now, another, a, a, another important consequence of polluting earlier is that you got richer, okay? As the, as the first speaker pointed out, modern economic development is based on the exploitation of fossil fuels. The earlier a country started to successfully exploit fossil fuel, the richer it is today. Okay? And that's reflected in per capita emissions. So let's have a look at those. Okay? The actual, among, this leads, this, there are some small oil producing countries that have higher per capita emissions, but their total emissions are fairly low. If we look at the sort of major emitters, the, the country with the highest per capita emissions is actually Canada, because it's big, rich, and north, okay? 
Here's the United States, right? Nearly as large. Russia, Japan, European Union, Indonesia, and finally we get to China. All right, so Chinese per capita emissions are low relative to the countries that developed earlier. All right, in fact, they're about the same. Uh, they're even not as high as Indonesia, which is also a, a, a sort of middle-income developing country. All right? So when people from Indonesia and China look at the look at this graph, they see unfairness. All right? And this is not a graph that our president wants to look at. I mean, this is not, these are not the numbers that he wants to look at. All right. Um, it's time to call my parents. I'm a good son. OK. All right. Now, what are those emissions in China for? Well, most of them are for things that happen in China. But a considerable percentage of them are expended to produce things that are consumed somewhere else. OK? And so if, if, you, if you use buy something that was produced in China, you've essentially exported the responsibility for the associated greenhouse gas emissions to China. All right, and that's what this graph shows. So this is China. Uh, the red is the consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions, and the, um, the blue is production-based, and the difference is trade. Okay, this is export. Now that may not seem like a lot, all right, but that's a gigaton of carbon dioxide. It's actually a lot, okay? Here's the United States, and you can see it's the result. The, the, the reverse, and also for the European Union, that the, the carbon dioxide emitted by things being produced, the, the emissions taking place within the United States and the European <laughs> Union, goodness, are less than the carbon emissions and, uh, that are associated with things being consumed in the US and the European Union, okay? So one of the reasons that, that Chinese emissions are growing so rapidly is that increasingly China is becoming the place where things are produced to be consumed in the United States and in the European Union. Okay? So, responsibility is, who's responsible for that? Well, it's complicated. Okay? And that's another complicating factor in the international politics. Okay. Emissions and wealth. I said before that uh, wealth is associated with high carbon emissions, both because of uh, historical trajectory and because rich people consume more. If we, this, this shape represents carbon dioxide emissions. All the world's carbon dioxide emissions are in that shape, that champagne glass with no base. These are tenths of the world's population divided by wealth. Okay? And what you see is that 40% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions are the result of consumption by the richest 10% of people. When you get down to the bottom, the bottom half of the glass, the poorest half of the world's population is responsible for about 10% of total carbon dioxide emissions being produced in order to supply the things that they consume, okay? The very unequal distribution of responsibility, if we look at individuals, and most of these individuals live in more affluent countries, okay? They're disproportionately located in the more affluent countries. All right, 
Now we're going to look at the distribution of vulnerability to climate change. Now, vulnerability is a product of two things. It's a product of risk, okay? That is, what are the odds, do the odds that you will be hit by a hurricane or a drought, do they go up? How much do they go up for climate change? But it's also a product of ability to deal with those negative consequences. Okay? Now, there are lots of different studies, projections of future vulnerabilities, but they all show the same path. Okay? So I picked based on the most interesting graphics, but I'm not cherry picking the projections. The projections all show very, very similar uh, patterns. Okay? So what you see here uh, in this particular graphic. Uh, green means you're relatively invulnerable. Red means you're highly vulnerable. And yellow means that you're somewhere in the middle. And you can see that the most vulnerable countries uh, are South Asia, uh, China. Actually, coastal China is very vulnerable. Um, Oceania is very vulnerable. And Sub-Saharan Africa is terribly vulnerable. Um, and there are pockets within uh, Latin America that are quite vulnerable as well. And then again, this has to do both with ecological phenomena and also uh, economic phenomena. Here, this shows you the, the economic part of this. This is the projected distribution of lost wealth, okay? Uh, where blue means relatively little lost wealth. This is change in GDP per capita by 2100 compared to a world without climate change. Again, there are lots of different models and projections, but the patterns are all very similar. Uh, so the, the more northerly located countries that are more affluent uh, are projected to lose the least. As you get further south, you're projected to lose more. The United States and China are sort of in the middle. Uh, the bright red are the countries that are expected to uh, suffer the most loss in, in, GDP, in uh, per capita GDP, and this is a negative 100% the red. So this is dreadful, okay, the, 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 the projected consequences. All right, now, responsibility versus vulnerability. So now we're getting the two things together. Green is bad in this graph, okay? Dark red means that you are, you can't read it, but it says free rider, okay? It means that you have a high degree of responsibility and a low level of vulnerability. Bright green is forced rider. You've been forced along for the ride, your level of responsibility for creating the problem is low, but your vulnerability to it is very high. Okay? This is 2010. This is the projection for 2030. So what do we see? Again, we see that Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the, the Indian subcontinent, are being forced along for the ride, extremely vulnerable, to the consequences, very little responsibility for causing the problem, okay? So there's, there's nothing that they can do internally to significantly affect the outcome because it's being largely imposed on them from outside. And the dark brown countries have relatively little incentive to take major action because they're relatively, they're benefiting enormously from fossil fuel driven economic development and they're relatively invulnerable in large part because they're rich already. Okay, so giant seawalls will be built around New York and Boston and Miami. The one in Miami probably won't work, but this, this will not happen. They're not, nobody's going to build a giant seawall around Bangladesh. Okay? That money, there's, so, there's only so much money for building seawalls 
and it's going to go to protect the, the money is located in the more affluent countries and they're going to spend most of it protecting their own citizens. That's just normal. That's normal politics. Okay? So what do the less affluent countries want? They want compensation to help them adapt. Okay? And they want it from the countries who caused the problem and who got rich in the process. Okay? So remember, responsibility and affluence tend to go together just as vulnerability and poverty do. Um, this is what's called the international financing gap. The, the, um, uh, it's hard to, sorry, it's not a great graphic, but the, this is the projected need. Um, this is basically today, this is 2050, this is 2100. As you can see, there's a lot of uncertainty about, about the projected need. This is the amount of financing that is currently on the table. Okay? That, that, that green fund that President Trump denounced in his speech on Tuesday is part of this little amount here. Okay? This larger one is if all our exorbitant promises about how much we're going to provide actually materialize, you can see it's, 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 it's pitiful in comparison to the scale of the costs that face the most vulnerable countries. Okay, and again, as I said before, adding to this, or even producing this money, is going to have to compete with the enormous cost of adaptation in the rich countries. Okay? Building a giant seawall around New York City is going to be very expensive, especially if we actually want it to work. Okay? And that means that money doesn't go to India. Alright? Because there's so much, only so much money in the world. Alright, so the conclusion. Paris is indeed a bad deal. But it's bad for the countries who are least responsible for the problem and most vulnerable to its effects. So this has been a wonderful background that we've all just heard on international climate change. Um, and that was incredibly detailed and I learned a lot, I'm sure you all did. My talk is totally state-based. So this is switching from concerns about climate change and what we can do in the world to just strictly local, okay? Um, and just to, to review what we've already heard, um, the primary causes of global warming is human activity, most primarily the burning of fossil fuels, uh, generating electricity and operating our, our homes and our um, businesses. Um, power generation is electrical uh, production is the leading cause of air pollution and the single largest cause of U.S. global warming emissions. In Connecticut, it's important to remember that we actually produce more of our global warming emissions from driving our cars and our SUVs than we do from producing electricity. But um, the, uh, I focus on, I am the lead volunteer of the Beyond Gas campaign. So that's what I'm here to talk about to you today. Um, what is the natural gas expansion of Connecticut? Has anybody heard about the natural gas expansion of Connecticut? Good, good. Okay, so for some people it might actually be some new information. For a lot of you, this is not really new. Some important questions. What is natural gas? So nat natural gas is a marketing term, and natural gas is methane which is obviously a non-renewable fossil fuel. It's produced primarily via fracking or hydraulic fracturing, which is a horrifically environmentally toxic process. Um, why are these pipeline expansions occurring? It's uh, being driven by industry and by government. Do we need them? No. <laughs> um, where are the expansions happening? Some we know, some we don't. Um, how are pipelines going to affect our economy, our environment, and our health negatively? And how can I support renewable energy in Connecticut? So let's see if my talk can answer these questions. Um, where are pipeline expansions happening in Connecticut? So there's two different ways that they're expanding the use and the transport of methane or fracked natural gas in the state of Connecticut. So one of those ways is with the interstate pipeline expansion. So Connecticut has already three gas pipelines that have been in the state for about three years. But two of those pipeline companies, Kinder Morgan and Enbridge, Enbridge, formerly Spectra or Algonquin, 
Um, these two pipeline owners want to expand the interstate pipelines that go through our state. Interstate pipelines mean that they go through many states, they're regional, and they're approved by the FEDS, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. So what we're looking at right here on this slide, uh, Algonquin, the big long line, that's the Algonquin, that's the Kinder Morgan. Those, both of those lines are being expanded uh, right now, actually. Um, the Spectra, uh, Spectra and Bridge Algonquin is much more relevant to you guys because this is very close to your area. As you can see, it cuts from Danbury all the way to Putnam, um, and there are laterals. Those are the red lines. So um, those are lateral lines um, or distribution lines, which may go down to supply gas to people locally. But the majority of the gas that's coming through this expanded pipeline ultimately is destined for export to Canada from where it will be uh, shipped overseas. Uh, right, shocking and uh, horrifying but real, and we know this is true because some of these energy companies have already applied to the United States Department of Energy, they've already been approved, to be able to export fracked methane. So you do have to have that's right. Thank you. Um, uh, so they, these plans are not theoretical. They definitely are planning to export the gas from the Enbridge line. Um, the Kinder Morgan pipeline story is slightly different, and this relates to the other way that natural gas use and transport is being expanded in Connecticut, and that's the intrastate pipeline expansion. Um, so the interstate one, like I said, it's regional and gets approved by the feds. When they expand pipeline in Connecticut, it's only approved by deep or Connecticut Siting Council, depending on what kind of infrastructure you're talking about. Um, and the other huge, massive difference between the interstate methane expansions and the intrastate methane expansions is that you can't find out where the interstate ones are happening. And that's especially shocking. So what happened was uh, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection of the State of Connecticut last year was taken to court by the oil um, trade industry because they're angry at the way that methane is being benefited by our state government. And they said to the state uh, uh, Supreme Court, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, DEEP should not be permitted to approve pipe, gas pipeline expansion within the state um, and all the, the, the pipeline and all the infrastructure that accompanies that without doing any public notification of any kind, without taking any public comments, and without doing any environmental impact statements. That should not be allowed. So that DEEP was, take, was sued and taken to court, and the state Supreme Court of Connecticut <laughs> the three judges, two out of the three, said, um, in fact, Connecticut Department of Energy can do whatever it wants where gas pipelines are concerned. They can expand to include 300,000 brand new customers in Connecticut if that's what they want, because that is our state goal. Um, but they do not have to do a single environmental report, and they do not have to ever issue a public hearing about it or let anyone know where it's happening or take any public input on it. So this Kinder Morgan pipeline is only eight miles in Connecticut. Suffield and East Granby. It is also a three-state pipeline, and it is bringing fracked methane from the west, from New York into Connecticut, um, and also going through Massachusetts. The only two customers for the methane coming from this pipeline are Eversource and UI Iberdrola. Who are Eversource and UI Iberdrola? In addition to our electricity distributors for the state, the only two, can we say monopoly, they are also our only two gas distributors in the state. People say, no, wait, I've heard of Yankee Gas, I've heard of Southern Connecticut Gas, or other gas companies. Who owns every single one of them? Yankee, Eversource owns Yankee. UI Iberdrola owns Connecticut Natural Gas and Southern Connecticut Gas. So this project, eight miles of expanded pipeline in Connecticut, only has two customers, Eversource and Iberdrola. Where is that gas going to go that Eversource and Iberdrola are purchasing? And they keep saying they need more of it. There is demand. They're saying this project is based on demand. Well. Within the state of Connecticut, when we passed our first uh, comprehensive energy strategy in 2013, and various laws came out of that, you may not have even heard of the CES, but trust me, those things that came out of that energy plan are driving the laws for our state. That plan explicitly called for the conversion of 280,000 new customers to methane, mostly from oil, but from any you know, other sources of heat, um, and to do it with ratepayer uh, subsidies. At that time, when they hatched this plan around 2011, that seemed to make sense because natural gas 
seemed less expensive than oil at that time, and people were still believing this thing about if you burn it and you have less carbon dioxide, it's better. So then fracking caused the price of everything to drop. There is zero economic benefit from converting from oil to gas. Furthermore, we learned in the last few years about fugitive methane emissions, and that burning using methane is, can be worse for the climate than even burning oil or burning coal. And that's partly because of the fugitive methane emissions, but it's also something we heard alluded to a few minutes ago about that methane is so much more powerful than carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere, especially in its first 10 years of, of release. Okay, so we don't really have the need for it. Eversource and UI are scrambling to come up with the need. They're doing it with our subsidies. Our, our electrical bills are the highest in the nation among many reasons, but one of them being that we are paying already for a methane expansion within the state. So this is where the methane expansions are happening. We kind of know, we kind of don't know. Uh, okay, I already said this. Where is this gas coming from? What is it? Okay, so Marcellus Shale, has everyone heard of the Marcellus Shale? This is where they're sh fracking shale gas. Um, and shale gas was supposed to be the bridge to the future until we learned about economic no benefit and environmental no benefit. Um, so it's fracked. And where is it headed to? Canada, mostly for export. By the way, prices for consumers of energy in America go up when we export our domestically fracked fuels to other countries. But who benefits? Industry. Uh, this is what fracking looks like. I don't need to review. I feel like this audience is pretty sophisticated. Uh, it's not your grandpa's fracking well, put it that way. This is not traditional. Not that traditional drilling was maybe so clean, but compared to traditional drilling, this is drastically much worse. We're using millions of gallons of clean water that becomes permanently tainted after that per well. We're using tons of silica sand that gets mined primarily from like places in the Southwest and Indian reservations. That gets tainted. We're also creating tons upon tons of waste, radioactive and permanently toxic uh, with carcinogenic chemicals that are used as part of the fracking slurry. Um, that's what we're doing to create this, this power. We're dealing with waste, but we're not dealing with it very effectively. I think these photos show that. Beneficial reuse. Put that in really big, scary quotes. This would be coming to Connecticut, except for our fabulous friends and allies from Food and Water Watch have, passed, have helped towns to pass 18 fracking waste bans in towns, including Granford, if I'm not mistaken. What's the problem with fracking and bringing all the methane here? You have terrible destruction upstream. So that's from the fracking wells, the uh, environmental pollution, and the health problems that are being caused. We've got problems with the waste creation and disposal. Um, we can't let them bring that waste here, but they have run out of places to put that waste in Pennsylvania. Then when you come to Connecticut, you start expanding pipelines. You have permanent destruction of pipeline installation area. I've done this uh, talk with a hydrologist who was able to demonstrate the way that the pipeline construction permanently altered that land. And speaking of things like climate change and, and sinks, land can be a sink for carbon dioxide until you rip like everything good out and then compact it way down until it isn't like really healthy land anymore and then it's not as good of a sink. And that's what happens with pipeline construction. And then of course there is the fugitive methane emissions. Um, I just have to mention right here that up until very recently, we didn't know in Connecticut how much methane was leaking. We've heard about California leaks. They've done studies in Boston, Staten Island. The Connecticut Sierra Club um, commissioned the very first gas leak study in the state of Connecticut. We did it in Hartford. And it turns out that gas pipelines in Hartford, which are owned by C&G, that is to say Iberdrola, are leaking at at least five times the rate that CNG is aware of and that they have reported to Pura. We compared the data that we did from our hard study, objective measurements of 210 miles, compared with Pura data, which is largely based on just people calling them and saying, I smell a leak. You know, they don't go out and measure their leaks the way we did. There's a lot of methane leaking in the state, a lot. Uh, this is just a way of showing, methane's invisible. So, you know, you hear about oil leaks, everybody knows about that, but we don't see methane leaking. Um, so it's easy to not be aware of the, the harmful effects. Um, I want to say human health effects are devastating for people who live near methane pipeline, methane infrastructure. So it's not quite as dangerous as pipelines, although we do see some health effects there. But you mostly see health effects 
for methane, certainly for people who live near fracking wells. I'm not talking about that since we don't frack, and we hopefully will never frack in Connecticut. But you see terrible health impacts for people who live near gas power plants and people who live near gas compressor stations. Thank you.